Okay, so it is true, I am James, and this talk is about unhealthy relationships. The relationships between you and the online services that you share sensitive data with. So this talk is going to address the following question. How can we enable users to restrict how online services process and share user data? Now, this question was easier to answer back in the old days, when applications used local hardware, local software, and local data. The good thing about this setup was that data owners had a lot of control over how their data was used, because that data was stored locally and processed locally. However, Scalable cross-user applications were hard to build because applications were limited uh, to uh, the local set of machines. And then, as if in a dream, a series of bald men came down from heaven and they told us to move all of our workloads to the cloud. And we listened to those men because a man without hair is a man that you can trust. <laughs> and so, what does the world look like today? Well, if we look at today's world, most of our application code and data lives in the cloud. And the advantages are obvious. We get to outsource administration, improve availability, make cross-user data analysis uh, easy. But there is, in fact, a downside. Users lose control over how their data is manipulated by the application. So for example, uh, Facebook has been in the news because of third-party data sharing agreements uh, that weren't disclosed to users. Smartphone apps have also had uh, the same problem. And I'm sure that many of us in this room have suffered the indignity of seeing our Tinder dates later show up as suggested connections on LinkedIn. Now, as a little experiment, I actually went on LinkedIn and examined my privacy settings. So I found a GUI which said, should we show your information from your profile to users of permitted services such as Outlook? Right? Such as, the mathematicians in the audience will notice that LinkedIn has defined a weasel set of ill-defined cardinality and membership. And in fact, if you drill down and click on the uh, Learn More button, you'll see a bunch of similarly vague wording about a bunch of services that LinkedIn may or may not share data with. Now, mathematicians call this set potentially every online service that has existed or will ever exist. So if we go back to the example of our user, let's think about the questions that she might ask about her data. So she might ask about aggregation. Given a service that has multiple users, how is her data combined with others to extract cross-user insights? The user might also worry about derived data flows. So when she uploads a piece of data, the initial server might copy that data and send copies to additional servers. Those additional servers may persist data on storage devices. So what do those data flows look like? And the user might also be concerned with third-party sharing. What happens if there's another online service at the bottom that requests access to the user's data from the initial service? How can the user restrict those kinds of third-party data flows? Now, answering these questions seems very difficult. Uh-oh, reviewer number three alert. Reviewer number three thinks that this problem is already solved because reviewer number three had a rough childhood. Reviewer number three wanted Star Wars toys for his birthday. He got space fights instead. He downloaded a tour in a Game of Thrones one time. He went to jail immediately. He loved to eat french fries as a kid. They got eaten up by birds. My, my, my. So if reviewer number three looks at these problems here, reviewer number three might say, well, doesn't traditional notions of information flow control solve all these problems? So let's take a really quick look at how traditional IFC works. So the basic idea is that a program consists of assignments. Uh, uh, left-hand side equals a right-hand side. And the left-hand side and the right-hand side each have a label. A label is going to specify one or more owners, and for each owner, the label specifies the set of allowable readers. So if we have Alice and Bob, who can be data owners, and we have Charlie and David, who can be potential readers of data, then a label might look like this. So this label says that Alice allows the associated data to flow to Charlie and David, whereas Bob only allows that information to flow to David. So an assignment of a right-hand side to a left-hand side is only allowed if the label of the left-hand side is more restrictive. In other words, the left-hand side has to have more owners and or fewer readers than the right-hand side label. And so intuitively, an assignment uh, is only allowed if the assignment allows a value to be accessed in fewer ways than before. So you can visualize this notion of restrictiveness using a lattice. 
at the top of the lattice are the least restrictive labels, and at the bottom of the lattice are the most restrictive labels. And so IFC is only going to allow label changes that move downward uh, through the lattice in a way that restricts data disclosure. So imagine that we have a function that takes a single parameter. That parameter's label has a single owner of Alice and allowable readers of Charlie uh, and David. So if we have a left-hand side in which Alice and Bob are owners, well, and perhaps those owners uh, both allow the data to flow to Charlie. So in this particular example, if we look at the lattice, we see that this assignment is actually allowable because it's restrictive. It, uh, it, it, it decreases the number of people who can read the value. So all of this is very neat, right? There's been a variety of work on how IFC can be enforced statically by a compiler or dynamically by a runtime system. However, there's an awkward question. Where do labels come from? Hmm? I think we all remember that awkward conversation we had with our parent. Where do labels come from? Well, the horrifying answer is that humans have to assign labels. And furthermore, humans have to reason about lattices. That's right. Hey, kid, happy birthday. You got a lattice. Look at that. Bathe in its crystalline beauty. You are a future reviewer number three. <laughs> now, more seriously, what I'm going to claim is that the cognitive burdens of traditional IFC are too high for most developers and end users. And so Riverbed is a reaction to this. So Riverbed has three goals. First, Riverbed wants to simplify policy specification to reduce that cognitive burden. Second, Riverbed wants to give users confidence that server-side code actually respects the policies that users define. And third, Riverbed tries to have reasonable performance. So let's first look at how Riverbed simplifies policy specification. So Riverbed does not manage a lattice of labels. So instead, Riverbed just tracks uh, whether data is tainted or untainted. So for example, a user accesses a web service through an unmodified browser. That browser sits atop the Riverbed HTTP proxy. When the browser generates data uh, to send to a server, the proxy is going to attach a Riverbed policy to that data. That server is going to execute code atop a taint tracking runtime. In our Riverbed prototype, we modified a Python interpreter to track taint. So the interpreter is going to run IFC unaware Python code. In other words, that code has no labels. And as the code runs, it creates objects in the Python heap. And initially, all of those uh, objects are untainted. Now, when the proxy sends data to the server, the server is going to compute on that data and propagate taint as appropriate. The propagation rules are simple. If the right-hand side of an assignment is tainted, then the left-hand side should become tainted as well. So what's in a user-defined policy? Well, one thing is the set of TLS host names to which tainted data may flow. So for example, a policy might say that tainted data can flow to x.com. Riverbed's going to reuse the TLS key infrastructure that's already in place to implement HTTPS. A policy also describes whether tainted data that resides on a whitelisted TLS name may flow to disk or whether it can flow to uh, other whitelisted uh, host names on the network. A policy also specifies whether a user's data can be aggregated with the data belonging to other users. So a policy for Alice might look like this. She allows her data to be written to persistent storage. She allows her data to be sent to x.com and y.com. And she allows her data to be aggregated with that of other people. So imagine that there's a service run by z.com. Suppose that the x.com server tries to externalize user data to z.com. Riverbed's Python interpreter will intercept the attempted network access, check the policy for the data, and say, nine, this network transmission is blocked because it would violate a user policy. So in contrast, suppose that x.com uh, has persistent storage. So if the x.com server tries to write user data to storage, Riverbed checks the policy for the data and says, yeah, we can do this. This is good for us and the children, right? We can do this because the user policy allows that data flow to happen. And of course, when that data is read back from disk, Riverbed will ensure that those bytes are still tainted. And so I should note that in the common case, policies will probably be written by consumer advocacy groups like the EFF, not by users directly. Now, I know that the millennials in the crowd are feeling a bit uncomfortable about this. You're thinking, stop, Jimmy Mickens. My experience with the web should be unmediated. I want that organic farm-to-table internet. All that pure goodness rain on me like honey. Well, here's the thing. Your internet experience is already mediated. 
And the reason for that is that the internet is not safe for you. Okay, so if we look at what's currently sits between you and the internet, we have things like Google's API for blacklisting malicious websites, anti-malware scanners for downloaded content, and ad blockers and other types of uh, browser extensions. So I would argue that Riverbed's policies are compatible with current norms for a curated internet experience. All right, so imagine that we've got Alice in her policy. Now imagine that Bob wants to use the same service. Alice and Bob's policies are the same except for one crucial detail. Alice allows her data to be aggregated, but Bob does not. So Alice and Bob want to use the same service, but what happens if Bob actually sends data to the service? Well, what could happen is an attempted aggregation, where two right-hand sides with different policies are combined. Well, if this happened, Riverbed would have to kill the application, because otherwise Bob's policy would be violated. So the problem is that applications written in non-IFC languages will naturally stumble into such policy mismatches because these applications are totally unaware of policy semantics. So let me explain how Riverbed solves this problem. So at the beginning of time, a service has no users. Then Alice shows up and she uploads some data to the service. At this point, Riverbed reserves the entire service for people with Alice's policy. So if another user shows up with the same policy, the user can send data to the service, and everything works as expected. Aha, but what happens when somebody with a different policy arrives and sends data to the service? So here's what's going to happen. A magic occurs, and Riverbed is going to create an entirely new version of the server-side components. Huh? What? Really? Yeah, that's right. We're going to clone the entire server-side stack for each unique policy in the system. So in this example, we have three users and two unique policies. If a third unique policy arrived, we'd create a third copy of the service. And we call each of these copies a universe. So inside a universe, any piece of tainted data has the same policy. In a singleton universe, like the two on the right, we disallow aggregation, but we may allow data to flow to the disk or to the network. In a multi-user uh, universe, like the one on the left, aggregation is allowed and all users agree to the same set of sinks. So what's cool about universes is that they solve that policy mismatch problem. These mismatches are prevented by fiat because a universe only contains objects that have the same policy. So that's fantastic, but the universe mechanism might have some downsides. For example, there might be a lot of universes, right? Won't all of these universes be difficult to manage efficiently? So this is a good question. So now let's talk about the third bullet point. Let's talk about how Riverbed reduces the overheads of universe management. What Riverbed could do is it could try to place each service component inside a traditional virtual machine. But the problem is that each VM has to contain a guest operating system in addition to application level code. So cloning a new universe would require cloning multiple heavyweight VMs. So instead, Riverbed places each service component in a container. So in a container, the same OS is shared uh, by each container. So cloning, suspending, and resuming uh, a container becomes much more efficient because the containers have less state than a heavyweight VM. So this means that in Riverbed, spawning a new universe means deploying a new instance of the container graph. All righty. Now let's discuss how Riverbed gives users confidence that policies are being enforced. We're going to use a technique called remote attestation. The threat model is that users worry that server machines won't run trusted software, like a taint tracking Riverbed runtime. However, users do trust the server hardware. And I can already hear you saying, I don't trust the server hardware. But at this point, you've lived your entire life as if you trusted hardware. So I don't want to hear any of these complaints. It's stupid to not trust hardware. That being said, you might not want to trust the hardware. OK, so for example, the US government has accused Huawei of putting malicious circuitry in routers. This, of course, is deeply ironic because the NSA has also been accused of putting backdoors into hardware. So let's just rub two sticks together and build a fire so that we're not cold as we die. I don't know what to tell you. The world's a tough place. So for this particular talk, let's just assume that server hardware is trusted. So the server hardware is going to have a, a burned-in public key and private key. The public key is going to be certified by the hardware vendor, and the private key is never exposed outside of the trusted hardware. So at boot time, the hardware signs the, a hash of the bootloader uh, before the bootloader is, uh, sorry, before the bootloader is placed in the memory and then jumped to. 
And then later, the bootloader is going to ask the trusted hardware to sign a hash of the bootloader's hash concatenated with a hash of the OS. The bootloader then places the OS into memory and jumps to it. And so this process continues with each piece of software extending the cumulative hash. So later, during the remote attestation protocol, the client downloads the signed cumulative hash from the server. The client then verifies that the value corresponds to a trusted Riverbed software stack. So let's just recap briefly how Riverbed works. So a user interacts with an online service using unmodified web browsers. The user does run a Riverbed proxy, which takes our data and tags it with the Riverbed policy. The policy describes the TLS host names to which sensitive data can flow. However, data can only flow to those host names if the host names are running a trusted server-side stack that includes the Riverbed taint tracking infrastructure. Before the user uploads sensitive data, the user forces the host name to attest its stack. If attestation is successful, the user uploads the data. On the server side, all data that has the same policy is placed in the same universe. The universe leverages taint tracking to ensure that improper data flows are prevented. And if data tries to uh, become externalized to a different TLS host name, Riverbed checks to see if the policy allows that externalization, and if so, uses remote attestation to ensure that policies are recursively enforced. So now we move on to Act 3. Does any of this actually work? So I'll briefly describe some experimental results involving the overheads of taint tracking and the additional memory pressure caused by universes. You can read the paper for some additional results. So to examine the CPU overheads of taint tracking, we got a machine that had a four-core Xeon CPU and 16 gigabytes of RAM. So we ran our Python interpreter, uh, and we tested the performance of a bunch of application-level benchmarks, like running the Django web server. And so we kept the client running on the same machine as the server to minimize network latencies and emphasize Riverbed's computational overheads. And so what we saw is that across all the tests, taint tracking imposed a worst case overhead of about 19%, which we think is reasonable, particularly since our uh, modified Python interpreter is not heavily optimized. Now to get a more holistic view of Riverbed's performance, we ported several distributed applications to Riverbed, uh, including uh, Minitwit, which mimics Twitter's functionality. So this application code uh, ran in the Flask framework, and the data was stored in a taint-aware uh, SQLite database. So we tested the following Riverbed policy. User data could be aggregated, uh, and tainted data could be written to storage, but tainted data could only be exposed to TLS host names in the network that resided in our mini-twit deployment. And so to explore how universes affected the server-side memory pressure, we used the Apache benchmarking tool to saturate our server with requests. So on the y-axis, uh, we measured the aggregate throughput of the, uh, of the server. And on the x-axis, we varied the number of universes on the server. And we also controlled whether the server had 16 gigabytes of RAM or 60 gigabytes of RAM. And so we see that in the 60 gigabyte case, the hot universes always fit into RAM, and there was no performance degradation as the number of universes increased. With only 16 gigabytes of RAM, however, the server could only comfortably fit about 150 universes in memory. So after that point, Riverbed had to start swapping universes back and forth between RAM and the local SSD. And so the knee in that red line actually happened a bit sooner than we expected. So in some ongoing research, we're investigating more efficient mechanisms for virtualization. And now, alas, we must conclude. Allow me to remind you that the Europeans have been passing laws, okay, like the GDPR. Articles 6, 7, and 8 give users the right to consent for data access. Article 32 says that corporations are mandated to implement quote unquote appropriate mechanisms. This makes me feel Weasley, right? What does appropriate mean, right? So I think that we as a systems community, we should think about how we can help at the technical level users and companies to protect their sensitive data. So and by the way, the Californians are passing laws too, right? Check out the California Consumer Privacy Act, which provides many of the similar protections that the GDPR provides. So given all of this interest around data policy, I'm excited about Riverbed. Riverbed enables simple data policies, and they are defined in terms of very simple primitives, TLS host names, and whether data can be externalized to the disk or to the network or aggregated with that of other users. Policies are enforced using taint tracking and remote attestation. And by leveraging this universe mechanism and client-side proxies, Riverbed is compatible with IFC unaware code. 
So with that, I thank you for your time, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Hi, much from Microsoft. Um, how does the API routing work in your case? Like if you have different universes of web services for potentially different policies, right? So how, how does the routing, like I mean, from a web service point of view, it is just accessing a particular API? Well, let's see. To... So the way that you should think of it is, so inside a universe, routing sort of works the way that you would think that it would work. Right? Then there's a question of, well, can two universes you know, communicate between each other? And so that would be a problem, right? Because if, if, if data was externalized from a universe that has you know, some policy foo, and it goes to a universe that has some policy bar, then it's possible that user data would be manipulated in ways that are not allowed by the user's intent in that second universe. So yes, yeah, so the idea is that you want strong isolation between universes. Right, but I'm saying from a user, so like when I'm making an API call at the user end, how do I target a different universe, right? So I'm ah. still going to the same endpoint, right? X.com slash whatever get. Um, so who targets me to, okay, this is the universe that implements the right behavior for you versus for somebody else. Right, right, okay, right. So you can imagine, for example, maybe you uh, wanna uh, you know, use this, a social network under two different policies or something like this, right? So a lot of that would have to be done on the client side proxy side to understand like, hey, like this is your persona that you want to have this policy uh, with, then here's the persona that you wanna have this policy with. So yeah, you would need some plumbing on the client side to make that work. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about TLS, but TLS, as you know, is really not end-to-end, -end, right? You typically, when you go to a server, it's a, it's a host-to-host uh, thing, and the way data centers or services, web services are deployed today, there are multiple tiers in the way services get deployed. So when I go to some endpoint, I'm really going to a load balance, so that's where the connect connection gets terminated, then you have probably other internal, like TLS connections. What matters is really user data, which is what I, when I say I, I connecting to facebook.com, it's really user data, but I might be going through five tiers within Facebook. How do you solve that problem with Riverbed? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky problem, because the way that I've described Riverbed so far is that essentially, you can think of like this very complicated service as a single domain, right? And then once data gets in there, you know, we're kind of uh, assuming that it all belongs to you know, google.com or facebook.com or whatever. Now, the remote attestation, that recursive remote attestation, will ensure that you know, once the data gets into a particular domain, then any other place inside that domain the data is externalized to, it'll be running our taint tracking runtime. But you're right, there are some tricky things of let's say even like domain sharding, for example, or things like that. And so right now we don't have sort of a, a, a clever solution to that, although we are looking at that in the future. I will note briefly that there is a tension in terms of how much of the internal networking structure of the service do you want to expose? Because right now our policies don't have to deal with that. They just say it's a big black box, it has this TLS host name. If we were to try to expose more of that, then we fear that policies might become more complex. So it's a trade-off. Hi, um, what happens to the user's data when the policy changes? So if the user changes her policy? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Hopefully I'll see that at uh, NSDI next year. Uh, that's a great question. So basically, the, what, what I've described to you so far, it doesn't actually provide clean mechanisms, for example, to splice a user's data out of a universe, right? Let's say a user had a policy that said, I allow aggregation. Now the user says, nope, I just want to be in a singleton universe. We don't have in Riverbed right now anything special to enable that. So we would have to rely on application-specific mechanisms. Now we do have some ongoing research where we're trying to actually uh, automatically induce what those splicing primitives would look like, right? Because as it turns out, applications typically have some type of structure in the way that they access storage interfaces and things like that that might allow us to guess what those semantics are. But right now, if you're in a singleton universe and you want to delete yourself, that's easy. We just delete your universe. Uh, if you're in a singleton universe and you want to go to a non-singleton universe, well, we can delete your first one and then use application-specific mechanisms to put you into the new one. But you know, splicing you out of a multi-user universe, right now, it relies on the application. Okay, thanks. Hey, oh, just a quick one. Uh, is, th is there a partial deployment story or do you need all the websites in the real universe to support this? Uh. Yeah, so that's a good question. So right now, we sort of assume that at least the first hop is going to be bought into our system. Uh, after that, 
you can imagine, so we haven't implemented this, but you can imagine that you know, inside of each policy, uh, there's sort of a user ID, which you could almost think of as like a redress number, right? So let's say the service needs to uh, you know, send data to some non-riverbed system, you prompt the user you know, for authorization. Now, of course, I feel grotesque saying that because any solution where it's like, oh, I want to prompt the user in real time to say, they're just going to say yes and go on with their life, right? So that's not a very uh, fulfilling answer right now. Um, so that's one thing we're looking at. That's our current story. Uh, let's thank James once again. Thank you. <laughs>